As the fourth largest food crop in the world, potatoes are a very important part of the diet in many cultures. They're rich in vitamin C and potassium. They are incredibly versatile. And of course, they are also delicious. And here in the United States, the potato has a long history. French fries, believe it or not, were first introduced when Thomas Jefferson served them at the White House in the 1800s. I'm Charity Nebbe. On this episode of Iowa Ingredient, we'll visit Logan, Iowa to meet a farmer who grows a variety of vegetables, including the popular potato. And Chef Krista Farnsworth from Her Soup Kitchen in Iowa City warms us up with a robust potato soup recipe when she cooks with us in our studio kitchen. All that and more coming up next on Iowa Ingredient. Funding for Iowa Ingredient has been provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. A grant from the W.T. and Edna M. Dahl Trust. Chef Lisa Laval of Trellis Cafe and Chef Michael Laval of the Des Moines Embassy Club. For more than 100 years, the Des Moines Embassy Club has provided a place to dine, celebrate, and do business. Located in downtown Des Moines and in West Des Moines, details are at embassyclub.com. New Pioneer Food Co-op, offering local and organic groceries in Iowa City, Coralville, and Cedar Rapids. Everyone's welcome to shop the co-op, where local and organic isn't just a corner of the store, it's the cornerstone of everything they do. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about. For good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. Mid-American Energy, diversifying the ways we generate electricity by investing in wind generation capacity in Iowa. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Potatoes have a very long history. The Incas of Peru were the first people to cultivate this starchy vegetable, and that was thousands of years ago. Today, China is the world's leading producer of potatoes, but here in the United States, of course, there is a very good reason why the potato is the state vegetable of Idaho. Potatoes have even been grown in space in fact, the potato became the first vegetable to be grown in orbit back in the 90s when NASA thought it might be a viable way to feed astronauts on long space missions or even a way to feed future space colonies. The potato is pretty powerful stuff. Sometimes a notion hits you something that just pulls you in and doesn't let go. Something that might lead you to what seems like a spot you were always meant to be in. See, these are good for new potatoes. For Danelle Meyer, a fifth generation farm girl, that something was vegetable growing. I felt most human when I was in my backyard gardening or when I had dirt under my nails or I was it was 102 degrees and I was sweating and working hard and I didn't want to stop, you know? It's just like, oh, something about this really feeds me and, and who I am. After earning a college degree in public relations and working in that field for several years, Danelle's philosophy on good food helped to transform her life. I think that food is like our best preventive medicine. Like every day, every meal, what we're choosing to put in our body is going to um, reflect in our health for the long term. And I thought, well, if I want to have any sort of positive impact on anything, I would love to contribute really healthy food to um, my community and the people around me. So that's what I'm attempting to do with my life, is to grow good food that make people feel good. Learning from other vegetable growers and working hard to gain experience, 
Danelle created one farm, a place where she can produce almost anything, but... Here's kind of the funny thing. I like vegetables, I don't like fruit. So guess what I tend to grow? <laughs> More vegetables than fruit. Cabbage, kale, beets, and of course, potatoes. These are just a few of the vegetables produced at one farm. Danelle markets her products in several different ways, but her tried and true method is the Harrison County Farmer's Market. They're gold beets. Yeah. They're similar, but I think they're not as strong, you know, as a red beet. Growing good food for her community is Danelle's passion, and she works hard to get that food into people's hands. We do rely on convenience a lot in our lives for food and everything else, so it's like, okay, if you can make locally grown, chemical-free vegetables, super accessible, will people buy them? You know, so that's kind of my thinking behind that. And they will. The potato is a crop that is tolerant of this farmer's busy schedule. Potatoes can be planted and harvested throughout the growing season. They're patient in the ground and can hang tight for harvest. And they provide a creative and tasty outlet with many different varieties. This year we've got yellows, reds, fingerling potatoes. This year we're growing Purple Majesty. So it's a purple blue potato that has a purple skin and purple flesh. And I think uh, they stay pretty tried and true blue once you um, cook them and you can boil them and have like blue mashed potatoes. We are doing a Kennebec for the first time. I think it's a tried and true white potato. Good for boiling and that kind of thing. Let's see if we can get a pound of purples here. In terms of planting, you know, there's the old like philosophy of planting on Good Friday but I've planted before Good Friday, you know, by a couple of weeks, I've planted on Good Friday. The first ones to go on the ground are usually starting to be ready around the 4th of July, maybe earlier, it kind of depends on, of course, weather. I love that and we'll dig those as new and just wash them down and ba bag them and take them to market and people can keep them in the fridge and eat them right away. And those are the ones that are like so flavorful because they're so fresh. All of the potatoes are dug up, put into crates, and cured before being stored in boxes for the winter. We typically put them in like our black harvest crates and stack them in a shed, have good ventilation, and just kind of let them dry out a little bit. And then that um, kind of thickens up the, the skins of them and then allows them to store longer through the winter. Listening to her own personal call to grow fresh, healthy food is something that benefits the communities surrounding Danelle's one farm. And it's an inspiration to all of us to enjoy the bounty our Iowa land can provide. Just south of downtown Iowa City, in an unassuming building, you'll find Her Soup Kitchen, a family-owned and family-run restaurant Owner Barb Farnsworth and her head chef and daughter Krista strive to provide a fresh take on everyday cuisine, including soups, salads, and sandwiches. Open weekdays during lunch, you'll find a family that truly loves fresh, wholesome food and that wants to share that love with the community. My family has always been foodies. Each one of us has our own specialty and so we decided to pull our thoughts together and do what we wanted to do and do our own restaurant. We started taste testing with friends and family. Taste this soup, taste this sandwich, see what you think. And once everybody was liking our food, we started looking for a building. But uh, the rest is history, as they say. Our menu has grown and found our niche in this area. During the lunch hour, her soup kitchen is packed and the line will sometimes go out the door. But the wait is well worth it. Not only will you get a wonderful fresh meal, but you'll be greeted with a warm welcome. It's like the bar cheers. Everybody knows your name. We make a point of it. 
mom is such a social butterfly up front and so many of my friends and family that come in here, they're like, oh, your mom, she's so nice. Like, she just knows my name every time. Her priority is to come in and get our customers to enjoy their meals, talk to them about where they came from, do they like their food? If they don't, why not? That's what her job is, and she does a phenomenal job of it. They get to be part of it. Everything is open for my customers to see in the back in the kitchen. That's been a great reaction. I also put it back there so her and her dad can't <laughs> fight on the line. That's why it's the open air kitchen. Krista and her dad, Dick, manage the kitchen. These two become a well-oiled machine during the peak rush hour, assembling sandwiches, building salads, and managing not to get in each other's way. Dad and I run the back. Yeah, we've been doing that for quite some time. Our chemistry is phenomenal. When you work with someone five days a week, good day, bad day, happy day, you know, sad day, doesn't matter, you have to make our emotions click at every time, and we work so well together. I, I never thought that my dad and I would be standing in the kitchen online working side by side and we'll have 25 tickets deep and we'll be talking about the dog taking a walk last night and it just, it just, we're so good at it now. I like the way he said it. <laughs> oh no, she is Barb works with farmers and producers throughout the area, which allows the menu to rotate and follow the patterns of the seasons. Ingredients are always at their peak freshness. These two are uh, the tomato mozzarella and the portobello sandwich. It's two of our vegetarian sandwiches, obviously there's no meat on them. Um, our pestos are huge, we make them all in house and people are just a really big fan of them. I think they go good on any sandwich, but specifically these ones are good. The wonderful thing about her soup kitchen is that you can always find something unique and different. Because the food is made from scratch, the subtle differences pop up and the great quality never changes. For Barb and Krista, great food means a commitment to local, to keeping the food close, to loving your community. It's proving that healthy, local food can come in many wonderful flavors. It's this commitment that makes all the difference. And now we are here in the kitchen with Chef Krista, and what are we going to make? We're going to make poblano corn chowder today. All right, with potatoes. With of potatoes, course. yes, <laughs> obviously with potatoes, yep. Uh, we're going to start with the olive oil and the butter we're going to put in that pan. All right, and we've got the pan a yep. little bit warm here. We're going to wait for the butter to melt down a little bit, and then we're going to put our onions and our celery in there, get them all sauteed nice and coated up in there on the pan. That's a lot of onions. It's a lot of onions. <laughs> Everyone always asks why onions. Onions are a great flavor. Even if you don't like them, you still need them in there. Our celery. Well, then they just get transformed. Exactly. When they're, yeah. so, oh. You want to make sure everything gets coated with yep. butter and oil? Yep. It's the best way to saute it, as long as it's coated with everything. Garlic, we can put that in next. All right. Now it's almost starting to smell like soup. <laughs> <laughs> Long ways away, but we're getting there. <laughs> then we're gonna let that saute for a little bit. All right. All right, so next, now that we get those down, we're gonna do the veggie broth in there. Bit. All right. We're gonna add all our seasonings over here. A little cumin, a little oregano, and rosemary and thyme in there. And then the peppers, big part of our soup here. Poblano peppers. Yep. All right. Generous helping. Generous. <laughs> Those ones you can definitely switch it up. If you don't like it too spicy, do a few less. If you like it more spicy, I like it more spicy, so I tend to go a little more peppers in there. And then we're gonna do the potatoes in there. All right, and you cut them nice and small. That'll help them yep. cook quickly. Yep. Some people like them a little bit thicker. I like them a little bit smaller. Stir that up a little bit, see how much room we got in there. Like that. It's a nice big pot of soup. Yeah. 
And we're gonna saute some corn now. All right. Put that in there. And you just put that in, no oil or anything? Nope, just, just put that in. Basically what you're doing is just soften it up a little bit. Yep, and just gonna go this a little bit, softening up a little bit, get a little bit of color to it as well, is what we're looking for. And that's gonna go right in the pot once that gets all simmered up. Does it change the flavor or just the texture and um, color? I think it does. I mean, it's one of those things that once you get it warmed up and you kind of release some of those flavors so that once it's the pan, it goes to the pot and the flavors are already ready to go, all that good flavor is ready to go for it. So right. that's what I like. And you want a little bit um, more of a roasted, you don't want it to be like burned by any means, but just like a little bit of a coating of like a golden color. Get that roasted flavor in there with the potatoes, the peppers, all taste so phenomenal together. So Awesome. All right, so now that our corn is starting to get that nice golden color to yeah, it. it smells wonderful yeah, too. Does it just bring out the sugar? It absolutely it? does, like That's that great. smell and everything, that aroma. <laughs> That's gonna go in the pot. So we're just gonna get that over right. here. Nice little stir going sure. here. Get that stirred up a little bit. Yeah. All right, and what, what's next? Okay, then? so we've got butter melting over here. We're gonna make a roux, which will help thicken up the soup. Um, and that's where you get that hearty chowder taste into it. I'm actually gonna switch burners. All right. So with the roux, you're melting butter. Yep, you're gonna melt butter, and we're gonna start adding the flour to it. And I know that you can you can continue working on a roux. You're looking for a certain color. What kind of color are you looking for? With I call this it a sauce? wine color. It's like a rose wine color. It's almost you're almost at a stage of where it starts to be purplish. Um, so it's like that wine, that dark wine color. Uh, roux, if you cook it right, um, they can burn, but it takes a long time to get them burned. Um, the butter and the flour are gonna work really well together once they start cooking for a while. You don't want it on a high heat, you want it more of like a lower heat um, so it doesn't burn that really quickly. Uh, that being said, you always wanna have it somewhat hot enough so it's not just a clump but if it's too low. All right, so how long does it usually take you to get to that stage with a roux? Um, give or take, if you're in a hurry, you can do it quicker, but I always say probably about 20 minutes to a half hour is probably your best time frame. It gives it enough time to get that color without scorching it, going too fast. You can tend to burn it usually. So you wanna do like a slow simmer with it for about 20 minutes to a half hour, give or take kind of thing. All right, and what is the flavor that we get from that that makes it worth the time? To me, between this and then the cream, which we're gonna add at the end, it's that creamy flavor. You've got that thick chowder with that cream tasted with the butter and the cream together. Phenomenal tasting together. Um, usually I start the roux about the same time your pot is starting to boil. It gives that time frame because usually the potatoes probably about a half hour, 40 minutes to boil up. Once those get softened up, if it gets done before your roux is, just turn it off, put it on low. Always good, you don't want to get too mushy of potatoes. The roux, like I said, it'll, once it takes that time frame, um, you don't want to have it done before the potatoes are done. Because okay. when the roux is done, you don't want it to sit there, you want that right into the pot. So it's one of those things that you'd wait until the potatoes are pretty much cooked all the way, and if you have to turn it off, you can turn it off. Okay, so roux take a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. um, once you get to that time, like I said, 20, 25, 30 minutes, you're gonna get this nice color that we have it right here. It is beautiful, Yeah, Look you get that. that nice color to it. Um, like I said, wine color, a dark brown color, tan color, you're gonna want that. Once your potatoes have gotten to that point where they're softened up a little bit, you're gonna start turning them down okay. to a low. You're gonna give it another, another little stir, go ahead. Sure. We're also gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper into it. Okay. Help with that, anytime you have potato jars, you want a little bit of salt and pepper in there. Do you usually taste or do you just know? Um, no. I've, I've done the same recipe a lot of times. I usually can tell pretty good, but I always say anytime you make any kind of recipe, whether you're you know, a big chef somewhere or just home cooking, always taste it. Then you always can know you can add a little salt and pepper to it. So once this is done, we're gonna turn that off and we're gonna bring, I'm gonna take that special yeah. from here. There you go. And it's gonna go right into the, it's gonna be pretty hot, so be careful from it. I'm willing to back up. Yeah, it's gonna get a little <laughs> warm. You never wanna be too close. This is very, very hot stuff, butter and Flour, it's always gonna be very hot, so. Get that all mixed up. Like I said, that's what's gonna cause it to be thickened up a little bit, so you don't have as much of that waterness into it. Get that nice creamy, buttery taste nice. to it. You're gonna let that simmer uh, probably about 10 minutes or so on that low setting, um, and you're gonna start seeing it get a lot thicker. You're gonna constantly stir it so it doesn't start to uh, get stuck to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's what's gonna make that that th the thick buttery taste. Right. Once we get that way, that's where we're gonna end up putting the cream into it to make it the thick into it. All right. So once we've got to that nice consistency, it's been cooking for about 10, 15 minutes or so, we're gonna grab your cream. That's another one of those products where again, kind of like the peppers, you can add as much or as little as you want if you don't want as much. 
but it <laughs> it tastes fabulous. It tastes so much better with all that cream in there. <laughs> Once you've added your cream, you're gonna want to take it off the heat because you don't want cream to always burn. So you don't want that heatness into it. Okay. Um, at this point, you let it kind of simmer down for a little bit. Um, once it's been sitting for about five, 10 minutes, that's when I would probably taste test it, check to see if you need a little more salt and pepper into it, maybe a dash more cream. Sometimes I like a little extra cream into it. And voila, you have your, your soup's gonna be finishing up here. Wonderful. Well, it looks beautiful. It is. We have a finished soup. Can we try it? Absolutely, let's try this. All right. Oh, so creamy. Look at that. I've got some spoons. Mm. That is delicious, very mm. delicious, very good. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. All right, we've made a delicious soup. What are we gonna make next? Now we're gonna make a roasted garlic potato. Oh yeah. It's one of my all favorite right. dishes. It's an easy dish to make. Um, just gonna go in the oven, basically put it all together, throw it in the oven for a little bit. All so, right, and you've got red potatoes this red time? Red potatoes we're gonna work with today. Um, you're gonna start out, put a little bit of oil in the bottom of the pan. You don't want the potatoes to get too stuck to the bottom. Yes. <laughs> that did not turn out good. The potatoes, we're gonna just put these right in here. Again, these are probably gonna be a smaller cut. You can go a little bit thicker cut. Doesn't really hurt anything by any means. When you get to that point, we're gonna drizzle a little more oil over it. All right. I'm gonna try to get it evenly distributed. Yep, wanna get all over Great. those. A little bit of salt and pepper. Garlic, again, one of those things that you can do for whatever your taste is. I'm a big garlic person, I mm -hmm. enjoy garlic. So I like to put a little extra garlic in there. Parsley, right over the top of it. We're gonna put in the oven about four, 450, depending on how fast you wanna get done. I like four, slow cook it for about an hour or so. About halfway through, we're gonna rotate it and mix it up a little bit, so. Okay. I always like oh, to throw right. a little bit of extra parsley on top of it. Nice. And then we're just gonna serve that up. Do you use sauces? And um, this one, I don't do up. sauces, it's more of a dry thing. Um, the garlic and the oil into it give it that moisture to it, so you don't even need any of this, any kind of sauce to oh, it. Oh, wonderful, so, yeah. well, let's try. Mm. Chef Krista, thank you so much. Thank you. Much to the chagrin of most natives, Iowa, like many of its Midwest neighbors, falls into the dismissive category of a flyover state. It's that supposedly vast, empty space that lies between LA and New York. But as you and I both know, a bird's eye view does not do Iowa justice. To get to know the real state and its residents, you have to spend some time here. Now, down on the ground, there are plenty of ways to visit the state, but once a year, the best possible way comes when thousands of people get the chance to pedal their way from community to community. Ragbri is an annual seven-day bicycle ride across the state. Currently, it is the oldest, largest and longest bicycle touring event in the world, with nearly 10,000 participants riding each day. People from across the globe visit dozens of communities during the event, which makes Ragbri the perfect opportunity to demonstrate that Iowa is anything but a flyover state. My favorite part really is going through the small towns and, and, and meeting the people that actually live in the town. I mean, the, how nice everyone is, like how hospitable. Everybody's very friendly and just makes everything uh, easy and relaxing. Thank you. The quaint small town feel, the scenic agrarian landscape, and the welcoming people all show the very best of Iowa. 
But with this being Iowa Ingredient, a show dedicated to celebrating the incredible foods to come out of our state, it is well past time for us to talk about the food of rag rye. Well, when you're riding all day long, it's, it's kind of the centerpiece of the activity. Well, you got to keep your energy level up. You can't ride 60 miles a day on nothing. So the more food, the merrier. The days of basic burgers, soggy fries, or boring vegetables are long gone. Steak on a stick, end of the block. Sport your Benton County cattlemen. Go, oh, let it go. Today's rag bry enthusiast has a seemingly endless amount of choices when it comes to bicycle fare, from steak on a stick to ice cold protein smoothies. The pork chop, I haven't tried that yet. It's on my list. It has to be in the afternoon. I can't stick a pork chop in at 9 a.m. It's very hard. <laughs> two, two things are very memorable. The breakfast burrito from Newell, Iowa, and the legendary ham balls from Manson. <laughs> you know, not to toot our own horn, but rag brayers love us. I think by this time of the week, they're ready for some vegetables in their diet, so that plays well with our menu, and uh, yeah, they're just great. It's a great crowd. Food is one of the most important things to any bicyclist during rag bry. For many, biting into a great tasting sandwich or cooling off with an ice cold treat will leave an impression on them long after their cross state adventure is done. Food is a goodwill ambassador for Iowa, something we should all be proud of. It's very much worth it. It's a great town, great stop, great ride. That's it for this week's episode. I'm Charity Nebbe. Join us next time for another yummy adventure on Iowa Ingredient. All of us at Iowa Ingredient are fans of all things celebrating Iowa food. And in 2015 and early 2016, we visited the terrific restaurants, farms, and other food events featured on this program. But circumstances can change, so we encourage you to call ahead if you're planning a trip of your own. We hope that you get the opportunity to indulge in some of Iowa's delicious flavors and to visit some of our unique destinations. Thanks for watching. Funding for Iowa Ingredient has been provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, a grant from the W.T. and Edna M. Dahl Trust, Chef Lisa Laval of Trellis Cafe and Chef Michael Laval of the Des Moines Embassy Club. For more than 100 years, the Des Moines Embassy Club has provided a place to dine, celebrate, and do business. Located in downtown Des Moines and in West Des Moines, details are at embassyclub.com. New Pioneer Food Co-op offering local and organic groceries in Iowa City, Coralville, and Cedar Rapids. Everyone's welcome to shop the co-op, where local and organic isn't just a corner of the store, it's the cornerstone of everything they do. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about. For good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. Mid-American Energy, diversifying the ways we generate electricity by investing in wind generation capacity in Iowa. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service.